There we go. Hello, one and all, and welcome to a fun episode of Kaldheim Spoiler Review's variation of Top Dead Fonts. Now, as stated before, we're going to actually use Scryfall, so this is, at least of this recording, their updated version of Scryfall, what cards they have. There's probably a few we're going to jump on to Mythic Spoilers, since there were some that were actually uh, previewed by some cool content creators. But we're first going to look for the ones that are in Scryfall just real quick, and then essentially just go on with the cards. And this is live, so we're going to see some nice chat interaction and see what people's thoughts, as well as my thoughts, on the cards that we're going to see. So we're going to start off with not the most exciting card in the world, if I'm being honest. Story Seeker. It's one in a white for a dwarf cleric. It's a 2-2. It's a lifelink. It's a bear with upside. I could see some people... It's a good budget option if you're actually trying to do it in the cleric travel deck because a 2-mana two 2-2 two with lifelink, especially if you have lifelink synergies, not bad. Also, it's a dwarf, so if we have any, like, dwarf travel shenanigans, that's something to keep in mind, especially if we go into Borsto, uh, Boros Dwarfs with stuff like Magda and such, so that's something to keep in mind. Other than that, I could also see a possibility of this in Luris... It's interesting, I don't know, it, maybe Luris, uh, maybe Mardu Luris Dwarves? Maybe? Eh, I'll put that in the back of my mind for something to brew. Nevertheless, uh, this card is kind of on average, it's like a 6 out of 10. It's like a, not a bad card, but it's not like a great card. It's like one of those that it's a good, it's mostly a curve fill and limited, but there is some good janky brewing applications with this card if you are taking advantage of the tribal aspects of it, or the life gain synergy aspect of it. So, let's move on to the next card. This one is a translation, Warhorn's Blessing, four and a white for an instant, that's a lot of mana, but you can foretell it for two and a white, and creatures you control get plus two, plus one, until end of turn. This is interesting, because mostly for weenie decks, like any go-wide aggro deck, they usually like these Trumpet Blast effects. The catch, this is mostly though more of a nice limited mechanic than it is in a standard mechanic. There are some times where many like Trumpet Horns or like essentially token generations even actually do make it into meta and aggro style decks. Like the one I could think of was an M20, which was the four mana Boros spell, which you create two one one tokens and all your creatures get plus one plus one and such. Stuff like that essentially. So. It's kind of hard to recommend a Trumpet Blast to some extent in standard construction. That being said, this one is kind of tempting, I will say. Because mostly, if you're doing this in like the Blue-White Fortel deck, which I think there is going to be a variation of it that's going to be like a Flyers list of some sort, this is just another card you can foretell, and we are see going to see foretell synergies within the meta that, or within even this set, that actually are very tempting. So you could make an argument that if a mid-range, like, a tempo list that is essentially either flyers, if I'm going to have to make a guess, foretell deck exists, I can see in this as, like, a one or two of, just essentially because you have, like, a bunch of flyers. Then you essentially attack in with your flyers, and then just uh, activate this for its foretell cost. I think it's going to be very rare that you're going to cast this for 5 mana. I mean, it's definitely going to surprise some people. Like, the only time I think this will be cast for 5 mana, if I'm being legit honest with myself, is like if you have a Shark Typhoon on the field and you want a 5-5. Five five. That's pretty much the instant. <sighs> this one is just... I'm not, like, too impressed, but I can see its limited applications. It's like a 5 out of 10, though. It's, like, it's not bad, but it's just kind of one of those where I think it's going to be very fringe to the decks that want this. Still, never underestimate a Trumpet Blast in Limited. There are some times in Limited where this card is going to pretty much be a game-winning card. Let's just put it like that. Nets up. I feel like I just have to say it in kind of like this epic tone, so forgive me in advance. Battlefield Raptor! You know, kind of like that. Anyway, it's a one-mana bird with flying and first strike. Huh. This is interesting, because it's kind of one of those things where... At first glance, you mostly think it's a limited card, because, hey, it's a one-mana flyer. You're probably only going to use this in flyer lists and such. The first strike is nice against, like, early game, like, uh, one ones and such, or two ones even. But I think this has a slim chance to see some standard play, and mostly for two reasons. 
One, if aggro becomes a very popular archetype, we're talking with the stuff like Mono Red with Fervent Champion and such. As long as they don't have a second Fervent Champion on the battlefield, they play the first one, you could just play this down and it being a 1-2. It is going to be really hard unless the opponent has a shock right off the bat to attack into the Battle Fiend Raptor. Because first strike's nice, it gets the first strike in, it will deal one damage, but it won't kill the bird. That's perfectly fine. The second, more actual, sillier application, I would say, is this is actually kind of one of the more tempting mutate targets, you know, mutate from Akoria for, that I think we've seen in a while. Because it's a cheap creature, you get your flying, you get your first strike, and then let's say you mute mutate, say, a migratory great horn on it, like you're in Selesnya, let's just say. You then get a free four with flying first strike, and then you get that land tutor effect that for a basic tutor land. That's not bad. Let's say you also mutate like that octopus on this when you attack in. It's going to be a 2-2 with first strike then, which then it gets it more prone. Well, to be honest, its original stats will make it prone to shock too, so... Or stomp, if we're being honest. But essentially, you do that, you deal your damage, you draw a card. And if you have, like, any, like, of the big, like... Like, big, like, legendary, uh... Legendary, I would say, let me think, like, oh, Snapdats. Like, let's say you decide to mutate Snapdats on this, get the mutate effect, and then you just have a flying Snapdats. Like, the factor is that this is so cheap that you can sometimes, on some turns, if you're playing a mutate deck, just play this and then do the mutate right off and just get a really decently aggressive creature. So with that, I'm going to actually be a little bit optimistic on this card and actually give it a 7 out of 10. I think it's good for budget. I do, especially if you want to fight against the aggro, it's good for Flyers list, and I do think this is actually one of the more tempting, common mutate targets we've seen in the set, if I'm being honest. Ooh, we get a legendary. We get Maja. I think that's how you pronounce it. Bredegard Protector. Two, uh, two, one green, two white for a legendary creature, human warrior. Other creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So it's a lord. Nice. And then whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 white human warrior creature token. You know, I actually like this card a lot. <laughs> because here's the thing. One, it's a 2-free. Two 2-frees two are, yeah, for 5 mana, it's steep. Don't get me wrong. But you are getting the semi-lord effect, especially if you already are in Selesnya. And Selesnya mostly like to create wide board presences, or at the very least go into a mid-range type strategy. Think like Selesnya counters and such. And just being able to play this just to essentially get a plus one, plus one boost on all your creatures that are out there, that's really nice. Especially maybe you have a really big creature, you get the one little boost, and then maybe that will help with Great Hinge or stuff like that. Also, by the way, this when a Great Hinge is on the battlefield is really nice because then it becomes a free four, which is going to be a lot more trickier to remove. But, of course, the, the really good aspect of this card is the landfall. Let's be frank, it's landfall trigger. Where essentially, you create a 1-1 one, one white human warrior creature token. Now granted, most people will probably prefer their Scoot Swarm shenanigans, since it kind of gets a little bit absurd. But, I have been seeing Celestia Landfall decks going around here and there, essentially. And I can actually see this actually just sliding into that Celestia Landfall deck. Mostly because it's a lord, it buffs all your Scoot Swarms, it buffs all your Felidar Retreat Cats... It also, when it lands, it creates tokens, which then those tokens can be buffed as well by the Lord effect. I think this card actually has a better chance for standard than people take at first glance. Like, I'm kind of giving it out an 8 out of 10, because this is actually the card that actually Celestia Landfall actually really, really needed. Plus, also a really good one drop that we're going to be talking about in a minute, but that one drop is actually pretty much good in a lot of, of decks that have white within their mana base, so we'll get to that shortly. Next up, Raven Wings. Two mana for an artifact equipment. A quick creature gets plus one, plus zero, has flying, and has a bird in addition to its other types. Equip two. This one is just kind of cute. It's like a kite cell, essentially. So if you have a deck design, like I would say, probably the best uh, deck that would probably play this card would be probably the Ginger Brute style, uh, the essentially Glimmer cards. The Voltron-y, kind of like a Ginger Brute deck, you know, the one that plays Ginger Brute, a lot of auras, and they play, I always forget the name of it, 
All that glitters, that's what it is. All that glitters and such. Because this is just a cute card. It gets your gingerbread flying. You have all that glitters. It's an additional trigger that will put an additional stat on it. Make it big. I can see it in that fringe deck. Maybe also, like, if there's a deck that's bird tribal. Maybe. <laughs> because, hey, there is a fact that it's a bird. But at the moment, we don't really have any bird lords. We have flying lords, but we don't really have bird lords. So who knows? I don't think the bird part of this is going to be relevant. Maybe it's a hint for sets to come. Maybe for budget builds. Overall, though, I think I'm just going to give this a 5 out of 10. Like, it's not bad, and I could definitely see the decks that want this, but it's not amazing either. It's just kind of like... If you need a plus one boost and a flying boost, here you go. If you want to do it. But though, granted, never underestimate this card in Limited, because if you have like a really big creature, like a giant, being able to give your giant flying and a plus one boost is nothing to underestimate. So eh, keep it in mind if you don't have any better cards and you need to find a way to get an evasive creature. This helps you make an evasive creature in Limited. Next up, <laughs> the card... That made so many memes. Colossal Plow. <laughs> Two mana for an artifact vehicle. It has, whenever this creature attacks, add free white mana and you gain free life. Until in a turn, you don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. And it has a crew of sits, which is pretty steep. But I actually like this card a lot. First of all... Let's just talk about how Kaldheim, Kaldheim in general has been really good with the flavor, because the flavor on this is so on point, it's, like, amazing. Like, the factor is, you are essentially uh, piloting this plow, which is ta giving you plains mana, so it's kind of like doing the flavor of harvesting the fields, harvesting the plains, to get plains mana, and also to get nutrition, which gets you life, aka the food stuff. It's just so on flavor, it's not even funny. And we also have that Ox. I don't know if we talked about the Ox yet, but we do have an Ox in the format that's at zero sits that essentially can accrue uh, with its toughness. So the fact that even the Ox can actually help with the plow to actually essentially crew it, which then essentially helps you generate mana slash food, so to speak, it is just so on flavor, it's not even funny. Also, other things to keep in mind, you could also mutate this, which is going to be pretty cute, especially if you mutate this on something like a Vadrock. Also, one thing to keep in mind for people, I would say keep an eye on a Vadrock in the upcoming expansion, especially with the vehicles we're getting. Actually, that should be something I should do for the Brewing Labs, actually. Okay, put that on Brewing Labs, potential. But yeah, you can, once this becomes a creature, you can mutate on it and make sure the creature portion is on top. That way it stays a creature permanently. Granted, it makes it prone to more removal and board wipes, but you do get the constant attack effect from this, which is actually pretty nice. Just that ramp and life gain is nothing to underestimate. I can see people trying this card out. Like, either for the memes, because trust me, this card had generated so many memes and puns, it's glorious. <laughs> I can see some jank brewing with this card. It's actually a really flavorful card, and it's actually pretty good for an uncommon vehicle. Actually, I think I've been saying that. The vehicles in this set, they're not busted, but they're actually pretty good. So, yeah, this one is a... I'm going to be optimistic, give it an 8 out of 10. I think this card is actually a lot better than you probably would take at first glance. And maybe a little bit biased toward the flavor, but seriously, the flavor on this card is... Next up... Another really good card, it's Scent of the Worthy. One white and a black, so Orzov. For an enchantment saga, it has step one and two, choose a creature you control. Until your next turn, all damage that would be dealt to creatures you control is dealt to that creature instead. And it also has a step three, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with a flying counter on it. This creature is an angel warrior in addition to its other types. Okay, this is a really good card because... First of all, it's not, like, as good as the rare one, but this is still pretty good, because the thing is, step one and step two, there's a few applications you can do this, some of them in the more jankier applications, but there's also some practical applications with this. Let's say, for example, you have... 
oh, I don't know, like, let's see, you're playing this in Orzhov, so let's say you're playing this in, like, the light game deck of some sort. Let's say you have that one-drop cleric, and then you have, like, say, a two-drop of some sort that you don't mind. Like, let's say, uh, I don't know, let me think. Like, it's not technically legal and standard, but let's just say a giant's primate. You obviously want to protect the giant's primate, or you might want to protect the cleric. So let's say the opponent tries to shock, well, essentially then... You can play this on turn three, and then just choose a creature. So, like, let's say you choose the, like, the cleric. And then your opponent tries to shock the giant's pride mate. You then essentially can redirect the damage to the cleric, which then the cleric will die, but you still protect your giant's pride mate. You know, like, little applications like that. Also, this is kind of a really, really good card for combat, because here's the thing. If you have, like, a creature that's, like, more like an early game, like, just build your board presence, but you have more of a mid-range aggro deck, this can just be really good to help with against trades and such. Like, you pretty much go to step one, you just, like, put it on a 1-1. One, one, and then you can attack with your 2-2, two, 3-3, two, three, three, four, 4 and such, and even if your opponent has a good board state to block, your creatures are still going to survive because thanks to your 1-1. One, one. And what's also neat about this is just the reanimate a package on this, being able to return any target creature from your graveyard and give it a flying counter on it to make it have flying, which is cool. And then make it an angel warrior, which could be relevant if you're playing this like in a warrior tribal deck or an angel tribal deck. I like this card a lot. Now, let's talk about the janky applications. Okay, janky application one. You can actually play this card and play a card like, say, Brash Taunter. On the first step, you're probably not going to get much, because even when you try to attack in, your opponent's probably not going to block, because they don't want their damage to be redirected to the Brash Taunter. However, next turn, let's say you're playing this in Mardu, and you target the Brash Taunter again. Play Storm's Wrath. Deal 4 damage to everything, except your board survives, because all the 4 damage to get dealt to the individual creatures is going to get redirected to the Brash Taunter, as well as the 4 damage that's already dealt to the Brash Taunter with the board life, which then could become a very funny lethal combo. Now, I'm not sure how effective this combo is going to be all the time, but this is going to be definitely one of the more jankier early access shots I'm going to give a shot at, because that's just hilarious. Also, there's other... I would say for this card, keep eye on cards that have synergies when it's dealt damage to it, like we talked about Brash Taunter, but there's even stuff like the... I'm forgetting it. It's from Pharaohs Beyond Death, but it's like the Flying Goat. I think it was a Flying Goat. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a Flying Goat. That had, whenever you get dealt damage, you put plus one, plus one counters on it. Stuff like that. So keep an eye on cards like that. That could actually be very synergistic with Ascent of the Worthy. It also could just be a decent combat tool. As much as I want to say that this might be a decent like way to help against combat tricks, uh, not that much because... The minute you cast this saga, your opponent will try to remove whatever you, whatever they think you're going to target with it, so to speak. So you gotta keep that in mind. Still, very optimistic about this card. So optimistic, I'm kind of giving it a 9 out of 10. I think it's really good. I think there's some jankier applications, but there is also just enough practical applications. And playing this on turn 3, it's very nice. And at the worst, if even if you don't take advantage of step 1 and step 2, it's also just a good reanimator card. Three mana, wait two turns, reanimate your most uh, most scary creature from your graveyard. Very nice. Granted, your opponent's going to see it coming, but still, that's a really good ability. Next up, the image is a little fuzzy on this one, so I apologize in advance. Doomscar Titan. Six mana for a giant berserker. It's a 4-4, four, four, but you can also foretell it for four and a red. And it has, when this creature enters the battlefield, creature control get plus one, plus zero, and gain haste until the end of turn. Meh. Honestly, it's just kind of meh. I think it's a good limited card, because still, at the very least, if you have the foretell, you can just foretell it if you need to, if you're worried about hand disruption, and then just play this on turn five to get, like, a turn five, more or less five, four, with haste that also gives your other creatures a plus one boost. That's not bad. That's kind of like a mini trumpet blast. Not bad, but I do think it's only going to be limited play with this card. I would be very surprised if it sees constructed play. It's just... The only way I see this card seeing play is, like, in, like, Polymorph-style decks. I like think Transmorgify, think Luka and such, and being able to cheat this out 
just to get a quick 5-4. But the problem is you only get the ETB trigger, so unless you play that into somewhat of a flicker deck as well. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> maybe in Giant Tribal, but I highly doubt it. Yeah, this is kind of like a 4 out of 10. Like, it's good in Limited. Like, in Limited, it's like a s average a 6 to 7, but in Constructed, it's like a 4 out of 10. Next up, Lidraller, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Green Glade Warden. Free and a green for a shapeshifter. So it can be anything. It could be a goblin, bear, etc., etc. It's a shapeshifter, it's a changeling, and it has an activated ability of two and a green. Exile creature card from your graveyard. And then put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. Activate this ability only any time you can cast a sorcery. This has been a really interesting, because we've been seeing this type of cycle of cards in the set, where it's like, have an activated ability, exile a creature card from your graveyard, you get this activated ability, boom. I think this is more going to be a limited base mechanic, since you are going to have creatures go into your graveyard when you're playing limited and such, and you don't mind exiling them from the graveyard and such, and getting the incremental effect. I don't know about Constructed. And the main reason why I don't know about Constructed is because I can see an argument for it, and I can see an argument against it. Argument for it. Technically speaking, we do have a lot of mill in the format. We do have milling rogues, Hedron Clab, etc. So being able to have creatures that have synergistic effects with your graveyard and being able to reduce your graveyard size is not bad. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad at all. But the problem is... Escape does a lot better job of that to be a counter against that. This is like a decent counter to it. It's not a great counter, but it's a decent counter. I would say it like that. It's decent, not great, but decent. So, eh, I don't know. It's one of those ones where I'll give it optimistic and say it sits out of 10 because I'm going to be more optimistic on the Changeling since you can put them into any tribal deck and you always have to keep in mind that they might be synergistic for a specific tribe. That could be the possibility with this card, so 6 out of 10, but uh, I can see this being cut pretty easily. Nope, decent card limited. Okay, this one is an alternate language, but uh, Disdainful Stroke. It's a reprint. Counter target spell with converted mana cost 4 or greater. This one's pretty simple. Do you need a counter Ugin or Genesis Ultimatum or a really high powerful four or greater spell and you are playing a control deck or you need counter magic to help sideboard? This is your go-to spell. I'm just grateful that we actually got this reprint because I don't know about you, but oh dear, I was getting so sick of the Ugins and the disdainful strokes and just the ramp decks. So the fact that a control deck can form, or at the very least, can have this as counter magic to help essentially keep the Genesis Ultimatum ramp decks, or any of the ramp decks in general, in check, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. I know people don't like counter magic. I understand. It can be frustrating. But I do think this is one that we kind of need with the meta at the moment being a little bit, at the very least, be a good sideboard card. So on average, it is like a... It's a 7 out of 10 from cards because it's more of a sideboard card. But there's some argument that it can be a mainboard card if ramp becomes a prominent deck type. In the meta, specifically. Next up, the Skimfar Avenger. Well, now the Avenger music is going through my head. Anyway, <laughs> one in a black for a creature elf berserker. It's a 3-1. It has whenever another non-token elf or berserker you control dies... You draw a card, and you lose one life. So, remember, it's another one, and it's also non-token elves or berserkers. So you gotta keep that in mind. I think this card's fine. I think it's overall pretty good. If you are in the aggressive deck where this wants to be in, a two-mana free one, pretty good. Also, the fact that it has the kind of like semi-draw engine where your one-drop like elf or berserker or your free-drop elf or berserker and such essentially will be able to allow you to draw a card if you don't mind losing the life. Remember, it's a you have to draw, it's not a may trigger, so this could also be risky if you're at low life, so you gotta keep that in mind. Besides that, I do think it's a good card. It's like an 8 out of 10 card, because it's just one of those, it's a good 2 drop, 
it has kind of like the Midnight Rider effect where you get the card draw if you ever go against like a board wipe or such, which these type of aggressive oriented decks want that effect essentially on their creatures if they can. If there's anything that's kind of negating the score from going from a 9 to a 10, it's mostly just the aspect of it doesn't affect tokens. And I feel like the elf decks, at the very least, want to have a recuperation for their token generation, at the very least. So the fact that you don't draw cards when another non-token elf, when a token elf dies, is kind of oof. But on the other hand, you could make an argument that if the elf deck becomes a massive token generator deck with a bunch of lords, maybe this is a lot better because you maybe don't want to lose that much life and draw that many cards. I can see an argument for that. But yeah, 8 out of 10. This, though... <laughs> you know when they get the FNM promo stream, it, it's something. Usher of the Fallen. One white for a creature spirit warrior. And it has boast one and a white, which is create a 1-1 one, one white human warrior creature token. This is really good. <laughs> it's one of those at first glance I kind of was not seeing this as the best, because I was like, oh, you might want to boast trigger, so you want to sure to make this evasive. Why is this not evasive? And then a lot of people, a lot of people who play the aggro in the mid-range kind of pointed out, hey, it's a one-mana two-one. These are really good. You want Savannah Lions and aggro-based decks. And I was like, oh, yeah, good point. So, yeah, it's a one-mana two-one. It's a it's Savannah Lion. It's very aggressive. Also, having the mana sink of the boast, being able to create human warrior creature tokens, which is relevant since we do have warrior synergies in the format. Very, very nice. Some people are even debating about putting this in Winota-style decks. It's that good. So, yeah. This is a really good one drop. It's going to probably see a lot of play. Keep an eye on it. <laughs> and it's an uncommon, so it's great to see when a what could be a format staple card is uncommon rather than rare. So, very nice. What can I say? It's a pride mate that can create more tokens. That's really good. <laughs> Next up, one that is also an FNM promo, but I'm kind of 50-50 on, if I'm being honest. Poison the Cup. It's an instant, free mana, but it has foretelled of two, and it has destroy target creature. If the spell was foretold, scry to... Oh, wait, I didn't read about... I didn't read that second part. If this spell was foretold, scry to... Huh. I did not read that second part. Originally, I was just looking at this, and I just thought it was just a murder, if I'm being honest. And I thought, okay, a murder that you can foretell for four mana? Why would you want to foretell it? But now I just read the second part, and it's like... Oh, that's why you want to foretold it. Because you get the scry. So, the way you look at it is this. Actually, this card is actually a lot better than I thought. Because, okay, you foretell it early. And then you can cast this as a 2-mana Doom Blade. Destroy any target creature. There's no condition on it. It's just instant speed removal. It's not like Heartless Act where you get the weird thing where it doesn't really destroy anything. And at worst, you could just pay free mana and just cast it instantly and be a surprise. Or if you get draw a late game, you could just foretell it. <sighs> That's a problem. The tempo with the foretell mechanic is a little bit tricky because if you want to get the scry effect off this, you do... Well, it is an instant, and they don't say, like... You can... No, actually, wait. This is actually a lot better because what you can do is on turn four, foretell this... And then at the end of the opponent's turn, or during the opponent's turn, if they generate a fret, you just automatically remove it, and then you destroy a target creature, and you get the scry, which is really good in control deck. Okay, I changed my mind on this card. This card is actually pretty legit good. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest. If this was just murder that had O oh, foretell for two and not the foretell synergy, I would not be as optimistic on this card. But now that I see the foretelled synergy on the card... Yeah, this is actually really good. This is like a 9 out of 10 good. Because it's Doomblade, essentially, that scries when you do the foretell. And at worst, you can just cast it for free mana as an instant speed spell. Okay, yeah, that's actually pretty legit. Okay, that's a 9 out of 10. <laughs> Next up, Strategic Planning, also promo art. 
this card is always pretty good. It's one in a blue for sorcery. Look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest into your graveyard. Honestly, I do think this card's going to be pretty good in the format, mostly just because we do have a lot of reanimator based cards in the format. And having these type of cards where you can essentially put cards into your graveyard, that's always really good, especially when we're in, like, Luris-type deck designs and also just other cards, essentially. So I could definitely see a play for strategic planning. It also sees play in control decks that have a slight reanimator package. So on average, this is like a 7 or either 8 out of 10. And mostly it's just good that we got new art so people can stop making the joke that we always get the art where Jace and Gideon are arguing over, over a pyramid. Next up, oh, this card's so cool. It's in its spirit. It's a one blue mana art, uh, uh, blah, snow creature spirit. Wow, that was a word jumble there. Anyway, it is a 1-1, one, one, which uh, at first glance you'll be like, oh, just a 1-1? One, one? Let's read the text, shall we? <laughs> so for two snow mana, so we never, snow mana can be anything that generates it. A mana that is a snow source, essentially. Two snow mana. Ascended spirit becomes a spirit warrior with base power and toughness 2-3. Activated ability, free snow. If this ascended spirit is a warrior, put a flying counter. Really, they are just doing really good with the whole flying counter synergies. I'll say this, it is kind of nice to see them taking some of the Akoria based mechanics, specifically the quote-unquote ability counters, and actually applying it to a few cards in the set. That's actually really cool. Anyway, you put a flying counter on it, it becomes a spirit warrior angel with base power and toughness 4-4. Four, four. And then four snow, keep in mind, this ability stacks. <laughs> so four snow. If Ascended Spirit is an angel, put two plus one plus one counters on it, and it gains whenever this creature deals damage to a player, draw a card. This one's weird. I think it's really good, but there is... <sighs> I always like these Figure of Destiny type of cards, don't get me wrong, and these cards get a lot better with the fact that we have Luris in the format. However, this is a card that is a significant mana sink. Yeah, so one mana, one one's not bad, and then you can make it a two free on turn two. That's perfectly fine. But remember, to get all this effect, like, you have to, including the initial casting cost, you have to spend ten mana to do this. Now, granted, you can make the argument that, like, oh, I can play this on turn one, then two, turn two, play this, uh, activate the ability, turn free, then activate the ability again, and then turn four. That's going to be perfectly fine, right? Uh, I don't know. Because the problem is, and this is a big problem, you have to remember that your opponent is going to play removal. So the minute they see this, and the problem is it's a mana sink ability, so the minute they see you activate this ability while the ability is on the stack, boom, shock, this is dead. Now, like I said, this get this gets a lot better since we do have reanimator-type spells in the format. And this could just be a decent late-game card that if you are in the late-game, you can just play this and then activate, activate the abilities you can at that turn, and then it just becomes a really aggressive-oriented creature. I can see that. Like, I'm optimistic about this card, but I'm more... <sighs> uh... The one argument that I could see this card being decent is... One, the reanimated package. Two, there are cheeky ways that you can quote unquote make this an angel without having to activate the abilities. Now, you don't get the stat boost that you get with the other activated abilities, but let's say, for example, you go into, say, an Esper deck, for example, and you play Ascent of the Worthy. You essentially have the spirit that we were talking about in the graveyard. Later turn, then essentially when the Glass Saga reveals, you reanimate it, it gets a flying counter, which then makes it a nice flying creature, and then it becomes an angel warrior. And then, essentially, when it reanimates, you probably will have enough mana then to activate the final ability, put a plus two, plus two counters, and just make it a free, free warrior angel with flying with that uh, semi-draw effect. That's actually not bad. That's actually not bad in general, so... I feel like if this card's going to see play, it's just mostly either going to be in lurus based animator decks or decks that do have a reanimated strategy of some sort... Or control decks. I do think control decks might give this card a shot, especially since there's a lot of better cards in the format that help protect one drops. Think stuff like that green instant spell we've seen, stuff like that. So I'm going to be optimistic and give it like an 8 out of 10. It's a pretty good rare, but keep in mind, 
it is one of those cards that is prone to, and I know everybody is sick about the die to removal trigger, but this one is more prone to it because the factor is opponents, when you sink mana into something, they are going to snap removal it just because they can give you the essentially mana loss from essentially having to activate the ability and such. So you got to keep that in mind. Next up. Another actually pretty good card. Blood on the Snow. Snow Sorcery. Sits mana for a Snow Sorcery. Choose one. Destroy all creatures or destroy all planeswalkers. That's interesting. And then it has to re then return a creature or planeswalker card with converted mana cost Etz or less from your graveyard to the battlefield where Etz is the amount of snow mana spent to cast this spell. This is a really interesting spell. Now, six mana for a Wrath is a lot, especially since we're in a format where there's a lot of four mana Wraths in the format. Think Shadow of the Sky, Extinction Event, etc., etc. But if you're in the Snow deck, I can definitely see an argument for this, because you get the board wipe, and it's also a situational board wipe. Let's say, for example, you go against Super Friends, because a lot of people have been theorizing about a Super Friends list that, due to one card that we're going to be talking about later... I could see an argument of being able to either mainboard one or two of these or sideboard them and then essentially just have this module effect where if your opponent has a bunch of planeswalkers, destroy them. If your opponent has a bunch of creatures, destroy them. And then also, that's not even talking to the fact that if you have any way to duplicate the spell and then be able to activate both triggers and then reanimate multiple times, there's also that. Well, it won't actually work because technically copies won't keep account to snowman is spent, so... You're still only going to reanimate one fiend even if you use a duplication spell on it. Still, it's not a bad card. It's definitely a situational board wipe, but situational board wipe with reanimator package, not bad. I'll say like around a 7 out of 10. It's good, but the problem is we are in a format where there's a lot of board wipes that are a lot better than this. But the reanimator based package on this does make this tempting in the snow deck. I'm not going to lie. Next up, oh, this card's so cool. So this is part of the cycle of these uncommon lands where they enter and tap, but they have a sack ability. Lichar's, I think I'm butchering that, Mirror Lake. It's a land that enters the battlefield tap. You add a blue mana, two green, green, and blue to sacrifice this land. Create a token that's a copy of target creature control, except it enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. Activate this ability only any time you can cast a sorcery. This is really good. <laughs> A 6-mana clone effect is actually a pretty cool ability to have on land. Now granted, keep in mind with these type of cards, you have to keep in mind that this is technically one mana than what you read. Like for example, this one you have to also tap the land itself as well as spin the 5 mana. So technically, essentially, 3, 4, 5, tap the land itself. Technically this is a 6-mana spell on a land. But 6-mana spell on a land, you really don't mind spinning in mana sync especially later in the game and limited and even in some constructed deck designs that's actually really good plus also just making a token copy of by the time you're casting this spell you're probably going to copy something really scary let's put it the frank there like you play this in like let's say simicrim you probably have like an elder gargaroth or like oh i don't know like a questing beast well granted questing beast is probably not a good example because it's a legendary creature but there's a lot of really aggressively oriented creatures that are either from mid-range or late game that are just significant threats. Like, if you put this in Teemer, there's Terror of the Peaks. Like, there's a lot of late game creatures that I could list off that, depending on what's your color coordination with your deck design, that being able to get a copy of it by just costing you just this much mana and just the land, you will pay the cost to do this effect. <laughs> and also, keep in mind, we do have stuff like Ancient Green Warden in the format, which then allows you to play the land back from your graveyard, which is really, really nice to help get this repeat clone effect. So, I'm going to be optimistic. This is a 7 out of 10. It's pretty good. It's actually a pretty good land. Might actually see some constructive play. Next up, Arachnoform. It's one in a green for an enchantment aura. And it has a chant creature, make it a creepy spider. And then it gets plus two, plus two, has reach, and it's every creature type. Eh, this one's more of a limited card. Do you have a really cool creature that you want to make it all creature types? Here you go. 
Though, I could see an argument for this in Standard if you're, like, trying to make, like, a creature that's usually not a specific creature type into a specific creature type. But on the other hand, we have Mask Ward Nexus in the format, so, eh, who knows? Maybe in Luris, maybe in Luris, maybe in Constellation Matter decks, I could see it. Eh, I think it's more of a limited card, though, so, eh, it sits out of 10. Who knows? Maybe it's a good budget option in Luris if you want to have a Changeling package or a Tribal package of some sort. Next up, whoo, this card is saucy. Glorious Protector. Four mana for a Angel Cleric with Flash and Flying. But you can also foretell it for two and a white, so this could be free mana Flash. And it has, when Glorious Protector enters the battlefield, you may exile any number of non-Angel creatures you control until Glorious Protector leaves the battlefield. This is interesting because there's some pros and there's some cons. On one hand, this is a really cool angel, and throwing it in the angel deck seems like it makes sense at first glance. Until you realize that second part where it's like you may exile any number of non-angel creatures you control. Which, yeah, it's cool that it's a protection from a board wipe, but the problem is... If you play this in Angel Tribal, chances are you're going to be playing a lot of Angels and just flashing this in is not going to do anything. Still, a free mana to four mana flash free four flyers, pretty decent. And if you can protect at least one or two creatures from your wrath, that's not bad. But also keep in mind, well actually this is good because this actually protects against Extinction Event, which is weird. Because the factor is if you put the spell on the stack, you flash this in, and let's say they choose like Odd, flash it in, hide it all under them. Uh, under the angel and such, and then the extinction event trigger will not affect it. But even if the extinction event is even, you can still flash this in, hide all your creatures under the angel. It does get exiled, but still you get all your creatures back, which then if there's any ETB triggers, that's actually really sweet. I feel like this is one of those cards that is really, really cool. But I think this is one of those angels that are mostly going to be relevant in non-angel style lists. Like, I could see myself throwing this in Cat Dog Tribal just as a way to protect my cat and dogs from board wipes. Think of it like stuff like that. Or maybe throw this in, like, the Goblin Tribal deck. Well, the problem is it can't really go into the Goblin Tribal deck. And no, it's not because it's a gob not a Goblin. It's because if you do the Mask Ward Nexus thing where you make everything into a Goblin, you're also making everything into an Angel, which then essentially then not makes it protected from this board wipe. It's actually a pretty well-designed board wipe protection because it's one of those where they don't want you to be too cheeky with it. At least to be doing broken stuff with Mask Ward Nexus. But it's still a really relatively good one against, like, if you're playing a mid-range or aggro deck. You probably still play this because it's still an aggressive flyer that you can flash in at the end of the opponent's turn. And if you can use it to protect your board presence, that's actually pretty good. I'm optimistic enough to actually give this an 8 out of 10. I do think this card is a lot better than it it taken at first glance. Next up, Dwarven Hammer. Two and a red for an artifact equipment. When this artifact enters the battlefield, you may pay two mana, two generic mana, keep in mind. If you do create a 2-1 red dwarf berserk creature token, then attach Dwarven Hammer to it. A crit creature gets plus three, plus zero, and has trample. This is really, this is actually pretty cool. So, I can actually see this in the equipment tribal decks because essentially this is a really decent equipment. Getting trample on any of your creatures is nice. Plus, later down in the game, if you need to, you can just cast this as 4-5 mana to essentially make a 5-1 with trample. Not bad, but not... It's not bad. Like, I wouldn't say it's a great thing to do, but it's not bad. Also, this is another one of those equipments that I am tempted to try in that equipment flicker deck I'm thinking in the back of my brain, where you just flicker this, spin the mana. Because the fact that you only have to pay generic mana for this effect is really nice. Just use it as a semi-token generation uh, card, essentially. So, yeah, I'm really optimistic on this card, but it's more for jankier applications or for limited. So it's like a 6.5 out of 10. I want to jank brew with it, but I don't think it's a great card, with the exception of maybe Warriors and, like, Tribal, maybe even the Berserker Tribal deck, if that exists. Eh, we'll wait and see. Next up, Master Scald. 5 mana for a Dwarf Warrior. Okay, it's a 4-4. Four, four. Okay. 
When this enters the battlefield, you may exile a creature card from your graveyard. If you do, return target artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. This is like one of those scenes like I stated before. This one is... It's one of those scenes where like, yeah, this would be decent. Like if you're tr going against rogue milling, essentially. You don't mind exiling the creature card. And you're also negating your graveyard a little bit more by returning a target artifact or enchantment card. Which is really nice. I can see this in some decks that are budget brews and want to re bring back like their sagas or Elspeth Conqueror's Death. Like stuff like that. And, you know, Dwarf Warrior, so it's either Warrior or Dwarf Travel, stuff like that. That being said, this is still a lot of mana for that effect. Like, for a 5 mana 4-4, four, four, granted, you are getting what it costs, but there's just a lot of better 5 mana plays in the format. I don't know. This one's like, maybe? This one's a maybe. Like, I'll give it a 6 out of 10. I don't think it's bad, but it is definitely one of those where it's like... If you have better 5 drops, you're probably going to be playing the better 5 drops. Next up. Whoo, this one's pretty saucy. Horrible encounter. 4 black for sorcery speed spell. Creatures that aren't the creature type of your choice get negative free, negative free, until end of turn. <laughs> oh, you do not know how much I wanted this type of board white spell. Now, one thing I tried to do is try to make Witch's Vengeance work since Rogue Tribal was a very popular archetype at that moment. The problem is, it worked, but then when a lot of the decks were trying to incorporate other cards like, say, the Ruin Crab and such, and kind of like go into that strategy, you didn't kind of in a pickle because you either were like, do I want to remove the Ruin Crab or do I want to remove the Rogues? Most of the time you want to remove the Rogues, to be honest. But still, it didn't felt like a good choice. This, even though you paid one more mana... It's so good, because the thing is, you can name the most obscure creature type, and as long as you don't have it on your field, or, heck, you can name the most obscure creature type, and just essentially remove a lot of popular board presences in the format. Like, you can name, like, Sand, of all things, and then all creatures get negative free, negative free until in a turn. That being said, if you are playing Creature Tribal decks, or, hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, the Changeling Tribal deck, you could just essentially name your tribe, and then it's just a one-sided board wipe, as long as your opponent doesn't have that creature type on their side of the field. Let's say you're playing Angel Tribal, boom, name Angels, their board presence is gone, and your Angels can go in for the attack. I can even see an argument of sometimes you naming the creature type that you have if your opponent has a more scarier threat of that variation. As long as it's going to remove it, as long as your stats are high enough that the negative free, negative free would not be that bad. This is a really good spell. Like, this is a 9 out of 10. This is a really, really good board wipe. Never underrate stat reduction board wipes. Language is a popular card. This is going to be a popular card as well. I could even see this replacing like well no negative four negative four was still really good with language so yeah maybe maybe the only catch twenty two is this doesn't kill questing beasts so eh you know the old can't kill questing beasts arc uh rebuttal next up six mana lavenous windworm it's a worm the art set are pretty dope but it has when this enters the battlefield you gain four life it's a sit sits with nothing else. Do you need a late game uh, threat essentially for your limited deck and you weren't able to draft something? You can draft this. Are you playing Yarrock in a budget build? You'll probably play this, especially if you have any life gain synergies. Other than that, no. No. No, 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 no. This is like a 3 out of 10. <laughs> like, okay, the very, very, very realm of you won't mind of getting this card is if you're playing Mormir on Arena. And you get this when you tap six mana for your more meal trigger. That's really the only time you're going to be happy about this card. Standard, no. Limited, if you need it, you can get it. In constructed, though, I really, really highly doubt it unless you're doing some janky Yerok shenanigans or you're doing a janky worm travel deck. But yeah, three out of ten.
Next up. <laughs> Scribe with silly names. My D&D &D official character. Five mana for a creature elf warrior. It's a 5-5. Five five. This is more for limited. If you need like an elf that's a top curve fret, there you go. Plus also there's bear in the yard. So there's a bear walker. Here's a card for you. If you're especially doing elf travel and you want a bear, here you go. Even though it's not bear or creature type. So it's bear in the yard at the very least. So yeah, but it's more limited. Uh, if you're making a budget elf brew in standard, may. Though, note I am saying that maybe with a bit of a twinge. I'll be optimistic and, like, give it a 5 out of 10 because it's alright. It's not great. It's more of a curve filler and limited. With maybe some fringe application of playing it in standard if you're either budget brewing or, who knows, maybe you actually like the art of an elf and a bear essentially attacking. Which, okay, if that's your stick, that's your stick. Oh boy, let's talk about this card. Big Stabby, as they call it, or Battle Mammoth, I think it's his official name. A 5 mana, but you can foretell it for 4 mana. Creature Elephant with Trample. It's a 6-5, but it also has, whenever a permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability a opponent controls, you may draw a card. This is a really big maybe in the format, because this card is really good. Like, a 5 mana 6-5, you don't mind spending 5 mana for that effect, let's be frank. A 6-5 with Trample, and the fact that if your opponent tries to remove it, you can still get card draw off it. Or even if your opponent tries to remove anything with spot removal, you still want to get card draw from it. That's really good. Like, your opponent will have to prioritize this and try to remove this first if they can. So just being able to get the semi-card draw effect from that, that's really good. The fact that you can just foretell this early and then be able to just cast as a 4-drop, that's absurd. Yes, we know, we know, this technically doesn't fare wear against the Cresting Beast, we know, we know. But if you have, like, any combat tricks or quote-unquote, hey, hint, wink, nod, nod, like, any fight effects, like, I don't know, ram through, this, like, on Sit's mana by casting him for the foretell pop, uh, cost and then ram throughing it that can be a really good uh, effect i'm not gonna lie so yeah i think i'm gonna be optimistic and give this an 8 out of 10 i think it's a really good card now the problem if there's any problem that this card's going to face is the fact that we do have a lot of good five drafts in the format like said before out of gagara etc 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 so it's going to be have interesting competition but i think it has a chance at the very least Plus, also, you probably don't mind casting us for Fortel to help uh, discount a great hinge next turn. Keep that in mind. Next up, Return Upon the Tide. First of all, this art is gorgeous. Next up, it's a 4 in a black for sorcery speed spell. It has Return Target Creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. If it's an elf, create two 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature tokens. It also has Foretell of free and a black, so if you Foretell this, you can cast 4 mana for the Foretell cost. I'm not gonna lie, I think this card's actually pretty decent. This is one of those cards I think it's gonna be a lot better of a limited card, especially if you go in the Elf Tribal deck. Because being able to reanimate a really powerful Elf and then be able to generate tokens, this is a pretty decent spell for that effect. Plus, one other thing, I think in... It has a slim, slim chance to see play in Constructed Elves, if I'm being honest, because just being able to return, like, a Herald or such from your graveyard to your hand when it gets removed, and then being able to generate the Elf tokens, which help you keep the Elf board presence, that's nothing to sneeze at. Now, we still have Herald Unites the Elves, which is probably the better if we are comparing these spells between each, each other, but if you have, like, a Fortel package within your deck design... I can see an argument for Return Upon the Tide. I think it's going to get most of its uh, glamour, though, and limited, but I would not be... I would not be surprised if some people try it in Constructed. I'll put it like that. Because it does have a little bit of potential in Constructed. Next up, oh boy, another oh boy card. Finn the Thanebearer. One in a green for a legendary creature human warrior. It's a 1-3. 
It's a human warrior. It has Death Touch. But oh wait, there's more. Whenever a creature you control with Death Touch deals combat damage to a player, that player gets two poison counters. <laughs> yep. They brought poison back into the set. Which, for those who don't know, is pretty much a prelude to Infect. Now, let's get some things out of the way because if, there are some people that made some mistakes about this card. One, no, the poison counters is not dictated by how much damage you deal. As long as you deal combat damage of any sort with a Death Touch creature, you will get your opponent to get two poison counters. No, it's not like if you give this a super buff, it's going to get more poison counters. Or if this gets stat reduced, it's going to get less poison counters. As long as a Death Touch creature deals combat damage for each individual Death Touch creature that deals combat damage, you are going to get a po two poison counters to your opponent. So, what do I think of this card? It's absurd. <laughs> Where do I begin? <laughs> okay, let's get started. First of all, if there is any, and I mean any card that is a non-elf that might see play in the elf travel deck, here you go. Why? Well, as you noticed before, We've been getting a lot of synergies of making elves have Death Touch. Remember how there's like Herald Unite the Elves? Or not even Herald Unites the Elves. There's like cards like the really good... I'm forgetting it. It's the Gregari Saga where it's essentially you destroy a target creature, get lands, and then all your creatures gain Death Touch until end of turn. Hey! Here's a card that benefits if all your creatures have Death Touch. And what archetype is probably going to go really wide in this meta? Elves. You see where I'm getting with this. Oh, and if you have any other way to give them evasion or make them have trample, you are going to have a very good chance of doing a lot of damage to your opponent, which then is going to give them a lot of poison counters. Like, let's say you attack with a white board, you at least get three creatures through, that sits poison counters. And then next turn, you, if you have any other creature that has death touch, or you can give it death touch anyway, Two more, two more. There's just going to be some times where I think people are going to underrate it because they're going to be like, oh, I'm playing against elves and such. Okay, they go wide. Oh, all the creatures now have Death Touch thanks to that Gagari enchantment. Boom, they play this. Surprise, all my elves are going to give you poison. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, this also doesn't have to be in elves. This also can be in party travel, because remember, we have that one vampire that's a party member that can give all your creatures permanent death touch. And a lot of party member cards in the Zendikar Horizon were very evasive-oriented creatures or cards that are really hard to block. You see where I'm going with this? I feel like this card is actually going to see a lot of standard play. Oh, and... That's to top it all off. This is also a two drop, which means that if you're playing Luris and your opponent will obviously try to remove this because they are going to remove this, you can just play Luris and just replay it from your graveyard. Oh, and by the way, another, like, if you want to go into the realm of not really jank, but another really s silly application of this card, let's say you go into Absent. And then, like, on five turns, like, you play Sternheim Unleash for five mana. Which then gives you, essentially, if I remember correct, uh, two angels. And then the next step of the saga, you give those angels death touch, and then you play this. Or in later, if you can cast Sternheim Unleash, if you can time it right and make a wide board of angels and then play this. You see where I'm going with this. <laughs> this card is absurd. This card, like, is really good. This is like a 9 out of 10 card. It This is one of those cards that's going to make Death Touch Tribal a lot more better. This is also going to be a card that's going to make, like, aggro go wide decks a lot better. Because we've been getting a lot of cards in the format that can make all our creatures have Death Touch. And as long as we can give them another way for evasive damage, like Trample or Flying or such, 
Boom, Chakalaka. You can easily kill your opponent without even having to deal lethal combat damage. This card's good. It's a 9 out of 10. It's absurd. Plus, also the EDH ramifications of this card. A lot of people have been having fun with the EDH ramifications of this card. It's a good card. It's a really, 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 really good card. <laughs> Next up, Arnie Slays the Trolls. We're actually going to talk about Arnie in a minute, but uh, let's talk about this uh, saga. It is an uncommon saga for Gruul. It is two mana, Gruul mana essentially, and it has step one, target creature control fights up to one target creature you don't control. Step two, add one red mana. Put two plus one plus one counters on up to one target creature you control, and it has step three, you gain life equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. Not bad. Actually, this is legit not bad. First of all, this is just going to be a really good limited card. Because this is unconditional, like, Prey Upon Removal, which then essentially gets you the second step, which is a mana reduction. Helps you for ramp, essentially. And then getting the plus one, plus one counters on one of your creatures is nice. But even with the ramp, you could probably just get out a big creature. And then you go to the third step and then gain some life. In Constructed, it'll be interesting. Like, a lot of people have been making a rebuttal that's like, well, we have Inscription of Abundance, which just does this, but a lot better. I will say, this as a saga for two mana is something to keep in mind, because if we do, like, a Jun Luris type deck, or any deck that can bring back this enchantment pretty easily, then you could make an argument of this card seeing a lot more play, because you can just reanimate it from the graveyard, do this effect all over again, get the mana, get the life gain, Etc. 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 Maybe even a Naya. Like I might consider this for Naya Cat Dog Travel because I would put Lurus in this list and just being able to constantly get this from the graveyard. That's actually not bad. Yeah, not bad at all actually. Okay, I gotta put that on my potential for Lurus Bruise. I'll give it a, about a seven out of ten. Like it's an average card, but in the right decks, there's actually can be some very silly applications you can do with it. Next up. Probably one of my favorite uncommon sagas they revealed. Nico defies destiny. First of all, art's legit. Second of all, cool saga. First of all, step one. You gain two life for each foretell card you own in exile. So, remember, when you foretell cards, they are all going into the exile zone face down. So this could, in general, sometimes give you zero life. But if you're playing the foretell deck, this can sometimes gain you up to two to maybe, like, I don't know, eight especially depending on how many cards you foretell but i'm going to say on average you're going to gain about two to four because you're going to play this on turn three you probably foretell in turn two so you're going to get at least two life so okay that's fine step two add white and a blue spend this mana only to foretell cards or cast spells that have foretell so this is ramp <laughs> this is ramp that either you can use as a way to just spend it on foretelling stuff or you could use it on a really big foretell creature. Keep that in mind. Then step three, return a target card with foretell from your graveyard to your hand. Whoo, this card is spicy. <laughs> okay, where do I begin? Okay, first of all, the step one is probably the least exciting aspect of this. But I can see some applications in control decks, just at the very least. Because if you're foretelling a lot and you're holding a lot of cards to play as control magic kind of scenario, like we're talking stuff like the counterspell, stuff like that, you could on average get about 2-4 to four life from this, which is pretty good. But the second step, the second step is what's the sauciest aspect of this card. First of all, this is gives you like a mana reduction because it essentially now makes this spell essentially cost 1 mana more or less. So then essentially you get 2 mana, and you can use that mana to either A cast foretell or b as i stated before ramp into a really big foretell creature we have some really powerful foretell creatures that you might not mind ramping into like that one spirit horse that make your foretell spells caught cheaper stuff like that oh and by the way remember that if you have the horse on the battlefield and you're on the second step you can spend that mana to foretell two cards that's really cool that's really, really cool. <laughs> and then the third step, returning a target card with foretell from your graveyard to your hand, that is perfectly fine. Especially if you're playing like counter magic and such, you don't mind returning a counter spell to your hand to be able to hold up for counter or card draw or etc. This card is good. This is like an 8 out of 10 good card. 
if though I will say if there's one cost to the card, you really, really have to play a lot of foretell cards within your deck design. If you don't, then this is a dead card. So yeah, you obviously have to play a lot of foretell cards. But if the foretell deck forms, I could see them using this as a semi backbone to the deck. It's that good. <laughs> it's that good. Next up, another one of these uncommon land cycles. Certain land, Frostfire, a land, it enters the battlefield tap, tap for red, five mana, and then you have to tap it and sack it, so technically it's six mana, sacrifice this land, scry two, not bad, and then this land deals two damage to each creature, activate this ability only any time you can cast a sorcery. Not bad. It's one of those ones where this is a pretty decent spell to have on a land, like being able to get a Pile Blast. Cat spending six mana on a Pile Blast, though, is very, very costly. <laughs> I mean, the only con I would say with this card is the factor is that if you're going to just use this as your primary source for, like, a Pile Blast effect, <laughs> by the time you have enough mana to cast the Pyro Blast effect on the spell, you are probably dead to the aggro that you're trying to use the Pyroblast to actually negate this card with. So, keep that in mind. That being said, if you are a control deck that has other realms of board wipes early game and you just need uh, another board wipe within your deck but you don't want to cost your card slot and just don't mind using it as a land slot, it's fine. Like, it's a 7 out of 10 fine. Like, it's a fine and a good card, but... Eh. It's very fringe on the decks that want to play this as their land, slash also get the semi-board wipe aspect of it. But the scrying and the board wipe, not bad. Next up, Tuskele, 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 like I said, I am going to butch these pronunciations, I apologize in advance. Tuskele Firewalker, two and a red for a human berserker, it has boast of one mana. It's out of the top card of your library, you may play that card this turn, it's a free two. Actually, a pretty decent common, all things considered. Like, this is obviously going to see play in limited because it gets you semi card draw. It's a very aggressive oriented creature, so you don't mind attacking in with it and getting the boast effect. And even if this card trades, you're still going to get the semi card draw effect, which can be able to play that card, either play a land on top of your library that you exile, or play another creature that'll build up the board presence. I can even see some arguments of actually trying this in Constructed, at least in budget-oriented deck designs. Like, if you're playing Artisan, I do think this is a decent Artisan card. So, I'll give it, like, around a 6.5 out of 10. I think it's good, but, uh, yet again, the only con of this card is there's a lot of better free drops in the format. A lot of better free drops in the format. Next up, Smatching Success. Free and a red for an instant. Destroy target artifact or land. Okay. If an artifact is destroyed this way, create a treasure token. <laughs> okay, I'll say this. A instant land destruction spell is actually pretty decent. And also being it have the versatility of being an artifact destruction spell, pretty decent. We still have that problem where using four mana for land destruction is a little bit steep. Like Everybody kind of wants it to be the pillage mana, and I would say that if this gave you a treasure when you did eat of the effects, then I think this card would have went up. Bloop. But the fact that this is only affected by artifact spell destructions and you get the treasure, it kind of goes down a little. Like, it's enough that I would say it's a 6 out of 10, because there are people who will try to make the land destruction deck, and it's a decent card in it because you can use it either for your land destruction gameplay strategy. Or you can use it for your, or to destroy a problematic artifact like the Great Hinge and get some mana reduction out of it. I will say, this is kind of one of those cool cards where I think if there is a standard application for it, is the fact that it's a versatile card that can either destroy a problematic artifact or a problematic land, because we are going to get some problematic lands in the format, like the World Tree or any of the uncommon spells that people, that starts getting popular in the format. So, I can see it having a slim chance of skimming into the format, but uh, it's going to have to prove itself. Let me put it like that. So, yeah, it's like a 6 out of 10. It's not bad, but it's not, like, great. Next up, Best Gear Shieldmate. 2 mana for a 2-1 solo piker. Human Warrior. When this dies, create a 1-1 white human warrior creature token. Eh, 
actually pretty simple. It's like a 7 out of 10. It's average. It's good. A 2 mana 2 1 that's being aggressive, it's nice. And the fact that it has a death trigger where it re gets you a warrior creature is nice. Now, on these type of effects, we prefer it being a flying creature. But still, the fact that this is a warrior and it generates a warrior. So if you're making the warrior tribal deck, being able to get a warrior back from being aggressive, not bad at all. But it's still like an average card. Like, it's not amazing, but it's not bad either. Next up, whoo, the Gates of Isfel. A tap land that has add for white mana, but it also has an activated ability of two white, blue, blue, and tapping it, so six mana technically to sacrifice this land. You gain two life and draw two cards. Okay, if there is any of these tap land cycles that might actually see some constructed play, it's probably going to be this card. Mostly just because the factor is that this just slots perfectly into Azorius Control. Because Azorius Control will always constantly try to control the battlefield. And then later down the line, if they have this land on the battlefield, they don't mind playing it early, so late game. If they already got enough of their mana, they could just use this, get some life gain, draw some cards. And the fact that this can be activated at instant speeds, it doesn't have the sorcery speed uh, restriction that some of the spells that we've been seeing have. So just being able to, at the end of your turn, if you don't need to counter something, just boom, sack this, get your card, draw, gain life gain. Very, very nice. So, it's an optimistic 8 out of 10. Like, I do think if of all of this tap land cycle, this is probably going to be the one that sees a lot of play. Next up. Ooh, this is a cool card. Kazima, God of the Voyage. Two and a blue for a legendary creature, God. It has, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may exile Kazmina. If you do, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control... If this card is exiled, you may put a Void's counter on it. If you don't, return Kazima to the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it and draw X cards where X is the number of Void's counters. But it's also MDFC, so it can also be the Omen Kill, a one and a blue for a free free legendary artifact vehicle that has a crew of one and it has whenever a vehicle you control deals combat damage to a player that player exiles that many cards from the top of their library. You may play lands from those cards for as long as they remain exile. Okay, first of all, the flavor of this card is legit amazing. Because <laughs> the thing is, you get this card, and that essentially what happens is, it's a Voyager going out to Voyage when it exiles itself. And then anytime you play lands, aka it's kind of like it's boring lands and such you essentially get experience, which is these Voyager counter things. And then when you want to bring it back, they're done with their journey, they're ready to come back, they bring experience, they bring themselves becoming stronger, but also the experience and knowledge by drawing cards. That's just a really cool flavor win. Plus, also the backside synergies with the flavor as well, because when you are explorer on this boat, you're going to explore new lands, exploring your opponent's library, you're going to try to essentially explore their lands, so you're going to play lands from their exile cards, which will get you more experience, which then helps with Cosmina God of Voyage. That's just... Seriously, the flavor of this card is so on point, it's amazing. Now, as for the card itself, it's a pretty good card. Like, granted, the only catch-22 is it's kind of slow, because the fact is you do have to cast this on turn three. You have to hope your opponent doesn't remove it. Or, honestly, you're probably going to play this on turn 4 and 5 and then hold up counter magic or a protection spell to make sure you get this effect. Then it exiles itself, and then now it's like any time you play lands and such, it's like a card that you're kind of like investing into. Think of it kind of like a Glimmer of Genius for one less mana that essentially gets bigger and bigger with how many lands you play. That's actually pretty good, especially in control decks. Also, this is probably going to see play in the mill deck because you can just build this up, build this up, play your Teferi's Tutelage, return this, draw a bunch of cards, mill your opponent's entire deck. Like that. So, with that, that is really good. Plus, also the vehicle aspect of the card is also really good. Just a 2-mana free-free, good stats, crewing it for 1, perfect. Yes, it can attack through the Love Struck Beast. We all know that. But remember, we do have ways to give this evasion, especially with runes. Like, I don't know, the rune that gives this flying. So this is a, fly a flying free-free vehicle that does this effect and mills your opponent. Granted, yes, it doesn't mill by the technical definition. But you're removing cards from your opponent's library through exile. That is semi-mill. Let's 
let's not cut the chase there. It is a semi-mill. You're reducing your opponent's library, which helps you in mill-based strategies. So yeah, in mill decks, I can see people trying this card out. In control decks, I can see this card being tried out because let's say you're controlling the board, you have the control to keep the creature side at least essentially protected until it goes to its exile zone. You play out the game, you play your lands and such, and you just need to restock your hand to get more counter magic or get your finisher. Bring this back in. It can even be a decent finisher because it might have a lot of counters on it. And then you draw a lot of cards, which can contain counter magic, all that stuff, which then helps you to essentially refuel your game plan. So it's probably one of my favorite gods they revealed so far. Like, it's a pretty close tie with one other card we're going to be talking about. But this card is really good. Like, this is a... I'd say this is like an 8 out of 10. I kind of want to give it a 10 out of 10. But the problem is you do have to protect it. And it is a slow card. So if you're going against aggro, this card is a little bit risky to play. I'll put it like that. Uh, sorry, a little bit of allergies. Anyway, Fault Wobbler. One of the red for a creature dwarf rogue. It has one and tap it. It's a creature card from your graveyard. Create a treasure token. Out of all these Etsy creature card from graveyard type spells, I think this is my favorite of the bunch because being able to essentially use your graveyard as ramp, not bad. And also it's a dwarf, so you don't mind tapping this. I mean, okay, granted you do have to tap it and tap one mana, so you could make an argument that it's more filtering. But if you're playing this in the deck that you also play Magda in... It can be semi-ramp because essentially then you tap the one, you tap this, you do the exile effect. You're going to generate two treasures technically, both from the activated ability of this and from Magda's effect. So I can see an argument of how this could be like a semi-ramp slash semi-fitzy. This is more going to be a really good limited card. In standard, I can see an argument for it. So I'll be optimistic and give it like a 7 out of 10. I do think it's that decent. Next up, Fearless Liberator. Two mana for a creature dwarf berserker at uncommon. It has it's a two one. It has both two and a red to create a two one dwarf berserker token or two one red dwarf berserker token. I think I just repeated myself there. Anyway, overall this card's actually pretty decent. The factor is it's a really good limited card I would say because at worst it's just a two one that more or less if you attack in and your opponent trades you can just activate the boast ability and get another two one. I would say it would be absurd if you create like a token copy of this, then it would be kind of silly, but it doesn't do that. You just get a 2-1 red dwarf creature token. That's perfectly fine. I do think this card has a chance in dwarf travel in standard because getting a way to essentially refund your attacking in by just essentially getting more board presence is not bad, especially if you have a way to give it evasion to some sort. But on the other hand, it is two mana, and like we've seen a one mana two one that creates a one one token when it boasts for less mana. So who knows? I'd say a slim chance. I'll give it like a six and a half out of ten. It's not bad, but it's not like amazing either. Next up, the Asgard Braggart. Free and a white for a dwarf warrior. It's a three three. It has both for one and a white. Untap this, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. This is interesting. On one hand, this is kind of like the boast effect here is interesting because it kind of gives it a semi-vigilance effect in a sense. Because what you do is you attack in, you tap it, you have two mana up, you can like let your opponent try to block it and try to remove it, but then you boast, you untap the braggot, you make it into a 4-4, four, four, which then, later down the line, you do the attack effect again. You can make it into a 5-5, five, five, a 6-6, six, six, etc., etc. So it can get bigger. And also, if you're playing this like in a counter deck in standard, this can get bigger really, really quick. You know what? I'm going to be optimistic on this card. I think I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. I do think on average, it's a pretty decent card. It's going to be a good card for limited. Even though 4 mana free free is a hill giant, and you don't really pay that much for a hill giant... That being said, this hill giant can get bigger and bigger every time it attacks, so uh, you got to kind of keep that in mind. So, yeah, I'll give it a 7 out of 10. I think it's just average, though. But it's still really cool in the decks that would probably want this. 
Next up, Gold Mole Champion. Free mana for a 2 free Dwarf Warrior. It has both 1 and a white to tap target creature. Okay, this one is pretty interesting for the Dwarf Tribal decks. Now, one thing to keep in mind with this card. The way you want to play this card is the way you want to do it is when you attack, you want to activate the boast ability before your opponent can declare blockers. Because then you can tap their really annoying blocker and then just attack in with your other dwarfs. Like, stuff like that. Like, even if your opponent has one creature on the field, tap down on one creature, you can deal damage with all your dwarfs. Like, stuff like that. I think, yet again, this is going to be like a 7 out of 10 because the dwarf travel deck wants to be a thing. And I do, can see an argument of this scene play because it's an aggressive tapper. I can definitely see that. Granted, the mana scene on it is a little bit... But it is still a pretty decent card. Especially in aggro-oriented dwarf tribal decks. Next up, Scorn Effigy. Okay, this one's weird. It's a free mana 2-3, which... Eh. But... It has foretell of zero mana. And you can foretell for two, so technically this is cost two mana if you decide to foretell it. Honestly, this card's weird. This card's weird because it's a zero mana spell, which... In the history of magic, you should never underestimate a spell that you can cast for zero mana. Especially if there's any, like, storm-like synergies in the format or ways, like... I think this is one of those weird cards that if it has a way to see place in standard... As stated before, there's been a lot of decks that have been trying to do the... Or at least we've been seeing in the set that there's a lot of these spells that are like... If you cast a second spell, do this. So I could see an argument that you might play this card, at the very least it's limited for that mechanic, because, hey, you cast this for free, and then you can on curve cast your spell that has the cast a second spell turn synergy effect, bada beep, bada boop. Like, for example, let's say you play that legendary angel that whenever you cast your second spell, you essentially get the synergy of that semi-card draw slash graveyard filter kind of scenario. So you can cast the Angel first, and then if this is in the Foretell Zone, cast that for free, it's your second spell, you get the second spell trigger, boom, and you get a 2 free. So if there's any way for standard application, it's probably going to be the aspect that it can be quote-unquote your second spell that can be on curve for opponents that are trying to do the cast a second spell shtick. That being said, that is probably the only way currently in standard I can see this card seen play. Because, yeah, zero mana is nice, but there are so many good foretell spells that we've seen in the format that we've been seeing that are coming into the format that, uh, I don't know. I don't know about this. I'll be optimistic and give it like 6.5 out of 10, because I can see the limited applications as well as the very, very, very slim standard applications. But... Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I could see myself being wrong on this card, but I don't think so. Next up, Tundra Fumarole. It is a free, one generic and two red for a snow sorcery at rare. It has, this deals four damage to target creature or planeswalker. Add a generic mana for each snow mana spam to cast a spell. Until in a turn, you don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. This card's nutty. <laughs> okay, yes, let's just get it out of the way because I'm going to sound like a broken record. Yes, this cannot kill a questing beast. We all know that. Yada, 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 etc., etc. You know what this can do to a questing beast, though? Deal four damage to it, and then if you spend snow mana to do that, you get free generic snow mana, which you can use to cast the mana rock that can essentially be a mana, or even any mana rock. You can do it to cast Guy Clay Frederick, or that snow one that we saw in the set. Do that, then tap a red mana shock. There you go. Questing Beast done. You get a significant mana discount to destroy the Questing Beast, and you also get a mana rock out of it. Bada beam, bada boom. 
But also what's really cool about this card is the fact that this card doesn't really become a dead card later down the line. Because if you have enough snow mana to get all the mana re uh, discount from this, this more or less becomes a free spell, which is pretty good. Plus also the factor is that even this is a free spell that gives you free mana that you can use on other spells. Like let's say for example you cast this on like turn... Let's say you cast this on turn 5. Okay? So you cast this on turn 5. Let's say you have a Chandra in hand. You want to cast a Chandra but you want to remove this really annoying creature that you think is going to attack your Chandra. Well, if it is has 4 toughness, boom, you do Tundra Fumeral. You still get the free generic mana, and you have two mana left to cast your Chandra. Boom, you get Chandra out, and you also get a board white removal, uh, a 10 by semi target removal spell. That's really good. This is a really good card. This is like a. Ugh, sorry, these allergies. Are... It's a 9 out of 10. It's really, really good. It has a chance to see a lot of play. Especially in, like, big red decks. Okay, I'm gonna take, like, a quick break just so that I can essentially get my allergies in control. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about more about this weird troll land. So I'll be back in a minute. Not the funnest thing in the world. Anyway, where are we? Oh yeah, Troll Land. Uh, <sighs> this card's weird. It's an uh, interesting battlefield tap. You tap it for red mana, and then you have to spend a total of seven mana for this effect, because it's the six mana and tapping it itself. To sacrifice this, you destroy your target land, but you also create a 4-4 green troll warrior creature token with trample. I'm going to say maybe on this card. And the reason why I'm saying maybe on this card is because, as stated before, we are getting a lot of powerful lands in the format. And being able to have this land destruction spell on a land is not bad. If it only destroyed target land, I would be less optimistic on the card. But the factor is you also get the Trample Warrior Creature token. That's really nice, especially since we have cards in the format that have Trample Synergies. I could see an argument for this, so I'll give it like a 7 out of 10. I think it's good, but it really needs to be in a very, very specific deck before it can be like very competitively viable, in my opinion. But land destruction spells with upside, eh, not been to underestimate, especially since it's on a land. Next up, Skimfar Out of Hall. It's a land that's tapped again, you can tap it for green. And then 5 mana and tap it, so 6 mana. You sacrifice this up to 1 target creature you don't control. Get negative 2, negative 2 until in turn. But you also create 2 one, one green elf warrior creature tokens. Activate this ability only any time you can cast a sorcery. Eh, pretty good. Like, I'd say this is like a 7 out of 10 as well. In the elf decks, I could see an argument for this. Because this can be work as semi-removal slash also just being able to generate more elf tokens. That's pretty good. But really, it's only for that. And also, you can reanimate this with uh, the uh, Ancient Green Ward and such, which, eh, why not? That sees play in the Elf's deck. That will, time will tell on that. But yeah, this is like a 7-ish out of 10. It's not bad. Next up, Dwarven Reinforcements. Free and a red for sorcery, but you can foretell this for one and a red. Creature, create 2-1 two, two, red dwarf creature burst. Uh, that. Create two, two, one red dwarf berserker creature tokens. At common. Eh, no. I mean, it's not 
bad. It's just not that great. Like, okay, you're spending four mana for two tokens. That's not bad. That's kind of average, especially since they're more aggressively oriented. You are paying your mana's worth for the spell. And being able to just spend two mana earlier and then spend two mana later to cast this and then cast another spell, that's pretty cool. But it's not really that exciting. You're just getting two two ones. They don't have any evasion. They're just two one dwarfs. So if you're playing the dwarf tribal deck, maybe, especially if you're doing any crewing shenanigans, maybe. But this is like a five out of ten. Like it's average. Like it's a very, very average card with very limited applications. Maybe as a budget option for dwarf tribal, I can see that. But besides that, eh, nah, nah. So maybe in Jeskai Dwarves with the Fortel with that Nico enchantment? Maybe. Oh, I am so excited to talk about this card. Mystic Reflection. One in a blue for an instant. You choose target non-legendary creature. Next time one or more creatures or planeswalkers into the battlefield this turn, they enter as copies of the chosen creature instead. Oh, and also has Fortel, one blue. Oh, this is so fun. It's not even funny. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the weird applications with this card. I may have already taught this on YouTube, but I think I'm just going to reiterate it again because it's that good. The fact that you can both use this as an aggressive-oriented spell, but also as a defensive-oriented spell, that is really, really, really good. <laughs> That's so good. Just being able to essentially, like, let's say you play this late game, and your opponent tries to play an Ugin. The fact that you can play this and target, like, your token, and then their Ugin's going to become a token, that's hilarious. But also, you can use this aggressive. Like, let's say you have, like, an Erdog Gargaroth on the field, you have a token generation spell, or even, like, let's say you're attacking with your Elder Gargaroth, and then before the trigger affects the attack trigger, you target it with Mystic Reflection, and then you choose Create a Beast Token... Beast token comes in, but boom, thanks to Mystic Reflection, it becomes an Elder Gargroth. That's just... Mm. So, this card's like a 9 out of 10. It's really, really good. I can see it seen play. Now, let me check. I think all these are just like the special art cards. There's some that are new that I'm going to cover real quick. Like this one. Okay, let's talk about this one. In Search of Greatness... Two green for a enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may cast a permanent spell from your hand with converted mana cost equal to one, plus the highest converted mana cost among other permanents you control without paying its mana cost. And if you don't do this effect, you just scry one. Okay, let's just get some few things out of the way. First off, I overhype the card a teeny little bit because I was kind of scared because anytime we see the aspect you cast a card for free it makes us think of the scary card of Fires of Invention and for those who haven't played Standard for long Fires of Invention was a really busted card like the amount of archetypes that were dictated by Fires of Invention was nutty Granted, it did actually also help that Wilderness Reclamation was in the format, but uh, even by itself, it was still a really good card. And many people are like, oh no, is this Fire of Avengers 2.0 at 2 mana? What are though? No. Okay, first of all, after more thinking about it, it's actually a lot more fairer than Fires of Avengers for a few reasons. Reason one. Remember, this doesn't affect itself when you do this effect, so... You have to make sure you have a permanent on the battlefield to get this effect. So, let's say you don't have any permanents but this enchantment and lands. You then will cast a one mana spell for free. That's not bad, but it has to be a permanent spell. So, not bad, but not amazing. I'm going to say that right off the bat. But then later down the line, it becomes pretty cool because then, like, when you cast a free drop, hey, you can cast a four drop for free at the beginning of your upkeep. Let's say you have a 5-drop, etc., 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 etc. But the thing you do have to keep in mind is your opponent is going to remove any of the problematic creatures that they don't want you to quote-unquote semi-ramp into, so you're putting more permanents on the battlefield that can be more prone to removal. you got to keep that in mind. 
Plus, also, this is a two-cost enchantment, which it seems busted. Until you realize that we have a lot of good early game enchantment removal. Gym Razor, Naturalize, etc., etc., etc. So, people might have a chance to just answer this enchantment before you get any beneficial synergies of it. That being said, there is still a pretty scary potential of this card being a very, very, very good card. Because even if you can't cast a permanent spell from your hand, because it's also dictated by your hand, which that's also another variable we have to talk about, because you have to have permanent cards in your hand that is one more than a permanent on your battlefield, which, granted, if you have an uncurved deck design, that shouldn't be too problematic, but it's still a theme that is going to be affected by variants. But even if you can't do that, you do still get the Scry 1 effect, and it reminds me of Search for its Kanta, where you should really never ever underestimate a card that can have a very powerful effect you don't mind having on the battlefield. But then if you can't do it, oh hey, you Scry 1, you get your draws better. You can draw into a better card that can, beginning of the upkeep, get your effect. But also, one other thing to mention that does make this card a teeny, 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 teeny bit worse... We never how upkeep triggers work. This is going to go into effect before you do your draw for the turn. Unless you have like a beginning upkeep phase where it gets you to draw additional cards, stuff like that. So this is not affected by the draw phase before you can do this. So this is going to be affected by your current hand. And the scry effect, while nice, you're not going to really get the effect on that until the next turn because like I said before, this goes off before you do your draw. So, I'm still going to be very optimistic on this card. I think it's an 8 out of 10. But there is a lot of more hoops to go through to make this card very scary than people take at first glance. But I will say, if someone can make the deck work... Whoo, boy, we're going to be in a bit of a pickle with the meta. <laughs> We'll just be in a little bit of a pickle. Because one thing that I think... I'll put one last thought before we move on. One last thought. This can actually be one of the more decent cards in a ch in Saga-style decks that we have seen in a while. Because you play your Saga early, and then you can get this effect, and get this effect, play more Sagas from it, or just play your creature board presence... Or even if you have a creature board presence, you can use this to play your Saga if you like have a 2-drop and you can play a free cost Saga for free. Which then the Saga will stay on the battlefield for a little bit, and then you can use this to get like a 4 cost Saga, etc, etc. For like enchantment constellation style decks that run the Saga package, I think they're going to get a lot more better beneficials out of this card, in my general opinion. Oh, and also one last food for thought. This is a two drop, so you can recast it with Luris, so you gotta keep that in mind. Yeah, if someone can make this deck work, it's definitely gonna be an 8 out of 10. It's a pretty silly card. <laughs> pretty silly. Let's see. This is a reprint, Revitalize, we already know about it. It's a pretty good card, especially if you're playing Life Game. We haven't talked about this yet, though. Valkyrie Sword, one in a white for an artifact equipment. When this in just the battlefield, you may pay 4 and a white. If you do, create a 4-4 white angel warrior creature token with flying and vigilance, and then attach Valkyrie Sword to it. A crit creature gets plus 2, plus 1. And of course, it has the really good Aaron Miller art, because if you want a angel art with a sword, you get Aaron Miller. <laughs> Overall, I like this card. The mana sink in it is pretty significant, don't get me wrong. So you are essentially spending 7 mana. But you are spending 7 mana to get a 6-5 Angel Warrior creature with Flight and Vigilance. That's not bad. And yet again, as stated before, I might try this in the Flicker uh, deck where you're essentially flickering the artifact, then spending the mana to create tokens to use as a token generation. I could even see an argument for that. I could see people trying this in Angel Tribal. I could even see people just trying this in general in equipment style decks. So... Eh, keep an eye on it. Might be pretty decent, but, uh, I don't know. If there is one cost to this card, I will say, it's the fact that, really, you're getting what is a decent artifact, decent equipment, because all you're getting is just a stat boost, 
with the fact of that late game, you can spend a significant amount of mana in it to make it into a angel warrior that's equipped with it. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. Fine enough that I would say about a six and a half out of ten. Probably out of the whole cycle, it's both the most cool, but also the most mad cycle, if I'm being honest. Okay. Let's see. Okay, here's a few that we haven't talked about. Rune Crown, free mana, artifact equipment. When this enters the battlefield, you may search a library for a hand and a graveyard for a rune card and put it into the battlefield attached to the rune card to the rune crown. If you search a library this way, you shuffle it and a crypt creature gets plus one plus one. We do have a hunch of what runes are a little bit after seeing the blue rune. So going off by that alone, I think the card's decent. Just free mana, more or less, just be able to customize this crown to be whatever you need like let's say we already know the blue rune gives your artifacts or equipments flying and the equipped creature flying so being able to play this attach the blue rune to it draw a card and then anytime you equip your creature it has flying as well as the stat boost that you get from the rune crown that's not bad also the fervor champion argument where you could play this in a deck with fervor champion and just automatically equip this also in Warrior Tribal, you could just play that one cheap Warrior spell, uh, instant spell, and then just automatically attach this equipment to it. There are ways to make this uh, equipment uh, very easy to get on things, so I'm going to be optimistic and give it a 7 out of 10. The fact that this can tutor for specific runes and be very customizable is a really cool aspect of the card that might actually make it a potentially standard constructible card. Next up, a card that's going to probably see a lot of EDH play, maybe some standard play even, Atzgard Armory. It's another one of these tap lands, enters the battlefield tap, you tap it for white, or you tap it for five mana. So this is one of the cheapest of the cycles. You sacrifice this card, search your library for an aura card and or equipment card, reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle your library. That's pretty good. That is actually really good. The fact that it says and or an equipment card so the fact is, you can be searching up two cards with this land. That is really good. <laughs> like, any Voltron deck will probably try this card out in EDH as well as in Standard if we get a Voltron deck. Because being able to search this and, like, search, like, a Maul of Skyclays or uh, all deck litters, that is really, really good for five mana. So, yeah, I'm going to be a little optimistic and actually give this, like, a 7.5 out of 10. Maybe even an 8 out of 10, because the factor that in the deck that wants this, they really would want this spell on a land. Next up, one of the more interesting commons? Resurrect Faculty. It is a free 2 of flying. Eh. But you may pay 1 in a white and exile or creature card from your graveyard rather than pay the spell's mana cost. So this could be a 2 mana free 2 of flying if you decide to exile a creature card from your graveyard. This, out of the whole Exile cycle, is the one that I think has a very, very slim chance of, but still a pretty good slim chance of actually seeing Constructed play. Mostly because in reanimated style decks, or slash decks that are going to mill and such, either by intentional or by the fact that you're going against mill, this card is actually pretty decent, because majority of rogues are like free toughness flyers, and just being able to cast this on turn two, which makes it really hard for your opponent to counter, because you exile a card from your graveyard and such, so then they have a hard time to drown and lock and such. You could, in theory, cast this out on turn two and then have a really good blocker against the rogues. Now, if there's a catch, is the two toughness does kind of give it a big oof, especially if the rogues have a significant buff, and this still dies to any targeted removal in the format, so you gotta keep that in mind. But if there's any budget options that might see play, and also it's an angel, so maybe you'll see play even in angel travel, so... Eh, I'm going to be optimistic and say this card has a slim chance of actually seeing some standard play, enough that I would give it a 7 out of 10. Just that uh, cost reduction is nothing to underestimate. And next up, last, but uh, certainly not... Well, actually, it's going to be the second to last, because we're going to talk about some cards that got spoiled on Mythic Spoiler, but... Uh, Last, but certainly not least, <laughs> Ridain, God of the Worthy. It's a legendary creature god for three mana, two and a white. It has flying, it has vigilance. 
Snow lands your opponent's control into the battlefield tap. We got snow hate, y'all. Woo! <laughs> okay. So it enters the battlefield tap, and then non-creature spells you opponent's cast with converted mana cost four or more. Cost two more of the cast. And then it also has the other side, which is Va... Oh boy, I'm going to butcher this. Vakmira, Protective Shield, free and a white for a legendary artifact. It has, if in a source an opponent control would deal damage to you or a permanent you control, prevent one of that damage. So make your opponent's bone crush uh, stomps into just dealing one damage? Not bad. Oh, and whenever you or another permanent you control becomes a target of a spell or an ability in opponent's control, counter that spell or ability unless it's control pays one. So literally, if your opponent tries to stop you, they're going to deal one less damage, and they have to spend one additional mana. That's hilarious. <laughs> so yeah, this card, as I stated, this is probably the tide of my favorite card in the set, along with the blue one. Maybe the green Eskira... Eskira... Uh, I'm thinking I'm butchering that name. Maybe tied with the Vigilance one. Like, okay, it's a freeway tie between Raiden, the blue one, and the green one that makes your legendary creatures mana dorks. Because this one is just so cool, because here's the thing. We can just ignore the snow hate aspect of it. And just the factor that if you ignore that aspect, this card is still a really dang good card. Because a free mana 2 free with Vigilance, that's fine in stats. But all those static effects, like making your non-creature spells your opponent cast cost 2 more, that have converted can cast 4 or more, that is really good way to protect this against board wipes. Like... Making it where your opponents like four cost rafts, and remember, we have a lot of four cost rafts in the format. Extinction event, Shadow of the Sky, etc. Making them have to wait till turn six to cast it. That is nothing to underestimate. That is the best aspect of this card. Plus, like the fact that you can play this card alone just because of that ability makes even the snow hate aspect of this so good because. You don't just have to play this as Snow Hate. You can still just play this as Board Protection Hate or just Protection Hate Spot Removal that is really high costing. That is not bad. Like, this protects you against Elspeth Conqueror's death. That is really good. And just the fact that you will play that just for that aspect alone makes the Snow Hate aspect of it just icing on the cake. It helps us keep Snow Lands in check. That's really cool. That's really nice to see. And just the flip side of it, if you already have the creature out, just having this effect is also another good taxing effect. So that's really good. So, yeah, this is like a 9 out of 10. This card is just really, really good. Okay, so before we move on, I am going to refresh this page just real quick to see if they actually updated it with the new cards that we've seen. And I'm in it. If not, we're just going to go to Mythic Spoilers real quick. Okay, they haven't, so... One trip to the Mythic Spoilers. And let's see the new cards. Okay. Oh, hey! They actually revealed a new one that I haven't seen yet. Oh, no. Is this a... Hang on. I'm going to check to make sure this isn't a leak. Yeah, it's a leak. Okay, we're going to avoid talking about that one until much later. So, eh, we're going to skip that one for a minute. Okay, just pretend you don't see it. Okay. 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 Just... Close your eyes. Okay, we're going to pretend that card didn't exist. Okay, so let's talk about the one that Crindor revealed. Arnie, a broken bow. It's a legendary creature, two red, human berserker. It has boast for one. It's a free free with haste, which is really nice. And the boast ability, which is, you may change Arnie's broken base power to one plus the greatest power among other creatures you control until end of turn. So... Yet, yeah, this is the Arnie that's from the saga. That's hilarious. Plus, also, just... This is actually a pretty decent card. Because here's the thing. If this is just on itself, on the battlefield by itself, and you cast this on turn 4, you're attacking with a 4 free because you're going to boast, and then this is just going to get plus 1, plus free, so that's 4. This is going to attack as a 4 free with haste. That's not bad. And if you play this, like, in Gruul, it gets a lot more better because there's landfall stuff. There's also, yet again... Lovestruck Beast, which then, if Lovestruck Beast on the battlefield, you can attack with this and attack as a 5 free with haste. Plus, that's not even talking about the aspect that if you have any, like, combat tricks and such, so that's really good. Yeah, I'm optimistic about this card. It's a very flavorful card, but it also has a really good potential, just with the haste, as well as the being able to change it into the biggest power that's on the board. So, I'm going 
gonna give it like around I'm gonna give it a seven and a half out of ten. I think it's a little bit average, but it's actually a really good average. Like it's like high average. And then let's see, was there anything before that? Before J Doubles card? Okay, yeah, there's that. So we'll talk about this and we'll talk about that. Okay. Next up, Frost Ugger. One blue, one blue mana. It's not even snow mana, it's just one blue mana. For a human wizard. Nice. That's a snow creature. Nice. And also has a tap ability for snow. Look at the top card of your library. If it's a snow card, so it could be a snow land, snow spell, snow permanent, etc. You may reveal it and put it into your hand. Okay, I like this card a lot. Because it's a decent one drop at the very least. But being able to, if you go into the snow deck, being able to just tap it and then essentially use that semi card draw or even semi scrying at the very least. That's pretty good. Also, the fact that if you go into, like, a Simic Snow deck and you play stuff like Yorn, which then can untap this. Like I said, I don't think Yorn is a great card, but there are incentives, like, with this, where essentially you can tap this, do your Simic card, maybe get a card out of it, then you attack with Yorn, untap your Snowlands, untap this, and then you can have mana just to sink into the Frost Augur's ability to look again, or if you want to. Because maybe you draw the card initially, and then you try to get a second card. Yeah, this has a pretty slim chance of seeing play. It's actually pretty good. Like, it's a 7.5 out of 10. Like, if a snow deck exists that's in blue, they probably will play this card. No sweat about it. Okay, last card of the day. Battleshield Warrior, and boy, I hope they spoil that Black Mythic tomorrow or next week. Because, eh, leaks suck. As stated before, leaks suck. Anyway, Battleship Warrior, 2 and a white for a human warrior. Both 1 and a white creatures control get plus 1, plus 1 until in a turn. It's a 2-2. Two, two. Eh. I think it's an eh. Like, here's the thing. Yes, the fact that you're giving an anthem to your board is nice. But remember, you can only activate both once. So you're only constantly getting a plus 1, plus 1 attack boost to all your creatures, which is not bad. But you are spending a significant amount of mana to get that effect. When you really want to build your board presence before boasting, this can easily get removed. Eh. It has like a slim chance, so I'm going to give it a 6.5 out of 10. But I don't think so. Whew. Nevertheless, that almost took about two hours. That's all the cards that got spoiled. We'll wait about talking about the leak till it gets officially spoiled. Nevertheless, thanks for all who watched this stream. I will try to upload it on YouTube as a video if you want to see it. Nevertheless, thank you for the time, y'all. I hope y'all have a lovely night. This is Love Dev signing out. A bada beep, a bada 